God's Psychiatry by Dr. Charles L. Allen Audiobook Part 2 Chapter 1 Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Shortly after Moses led the children of Israel away from the bondage of Egypt on their journey to the promised land, God called Moses upon Mount Sinai. He must have said something like this, Moses, your people are now headed towards prosperity. The land I have promised to them is rich and productive and will supply not only their needs but much more. In fact, the land flows with milk and honey. But Moses, people cannot be made happy and successful merely by the possession of things. The way they live is more important than what they have. So, I am going to give you 10 rules for living. I want you to teach the people these rules. If they live by them, I promise they will be blessed. But I warn you, if they break these rules, they will be severely penalized. And one other thing, Moses, these are to be the rules of living for all peoples of all times. They will never go out of date. They will never be repealed or changed. We have those rules known as the Ten Commandments recorded in Exodus 20. They are not only the basis of conduct, both moral and spiritual, but also the basis of peace and prosperity for the individual and for the world. The Bible says, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. And it is only a fool who thinks he is big enough or smart enough to violate the unchangeable laws of the eternal God and get by with it. No man can break God's law, he breaks only himself. Very important is the order in which God stated his laws. The first four deal with man's relationship with God, the last six with man's relationship with man. Before man can live rightly with each other, he must first get right with God. Someone has said, the golden rule is my religion. but. The golden rule is nobody's religion because it is not a religion. It is merely the expression of religion. As H. G. Wells put it, until a man has found God, he begins at no beginning, he works to no end. The first commandment is somewhat surprising. We would think that it would be, thou shalt believe in a God, a law against atheism. There is no such law. God took care of that in our creation. We do not teach a baby to hunger or to thirst. Nature does that. However, we must train our children to satisfy their hungers and thirsts with the right things. Man instinctively believes and worships. Nowhere does the Bible attempt to prove the existence of God. Man is created incomplete and he cannot be at rest until there is a satisfaction of his deepest hunger, the yearning of his soul. The danger lies in that fact that man can pervert his worship instinct and make for himself a false god. St. Augustine said, My soul is restless until it finds it can rest in thee, O God. No false god satisfies the longing of the soul but we can, and many do, squander their lives seeking satisfaction from false objects of worship. So the first of God's rules for life is, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. At Vicksburg, Mississippi, an engineer showed me an almost dry channel. He explained that once the great Mississippi River flowed there, but now it had been changed into another channel which had been dug. The flow of the river could not be stopped, but it could be diverted. So with our worship of God. Man is incomplete without an object of worship. The yearning of his soul demands attention. But man can turn from the one true God and make for himself another God. There have been people who worship the sun or a star or a mountain. In some countries, People worship a cow or a river or something else. We think of those people as being primitive. They are, 
but no more primitive than multitudes of people in this enlightened land we call America. God said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me, and that law of life we are guilty of breaking. There are five objects of worship which multitudes today have put before God, wealth, fame, pleasure, power and knowledge. While most of us have no idea of ever being really rich, we never become satisfied with what we can reasonably possess. Maybe that is good, except when that dissatisfaction obscures our feelings for God and diverts us in our search for God. I can become so interested in what I have that I forget the needs of my soul. Most of us never expect to be famous, yet the little child says, See how high I can jump or watch me run. We are born with the desire to be noticed. That is not wrong. God made us separate identities and we do want to be known. Yet, as a minister, I counsel with many people who have wrecked their lives and destroyed their happiness simply because they have not received the attention they desired. Many get their feelings hurt at the smallest slight. We spend in America more money on cosmetics, for example, than we spend on the entire program of the Kingdom of God. It isn't wrong to want to look our best, but it is wrong when putting ourselves forward becomes our first desire, thus our God. All men want to be happy, but we make a mistake when we think pleasure is the way to get happiness. There is forgetfulness of life's routines in pleasures, but they do not satisfy the soul. Pleasure is like dope. Gradually we must increase the dose with more excitement, more thrill, more sensation, until eventually we find ourselves groping among the tombstones of our dead passions. It is like making our meals out of pickles and pepper. One of our greatest temptations is to put pleasure before God. Power is not wrong, neither is knowledge. The electric power in America is the equal of 150 slaves for each of us and is a great blessing to us. But power worshipped turns us into little Hitlers. Knowledge is good, but the worship of knowledge destroys obedience, just as the worship of power destroys character. To worship God leads us to be like God and to obey His will. Thus, we become good and walk in the paths of right living when we have no other gods before God.